So I thought, um, what's the best way to escape for these troubled times and insecurity? Uh, for me as a reader, quite often escape means fantasy. So that's what my video today is about, escaping into fantasy. What's the difference between fantasy and science fiction? Science fiction often has to do with uh, science and space and alternate realities, alternate universes. There can be aspects of fantasy in science fiction, but most often it's a it's a alternation on a theme that has to do with science and maybe a little bit of twisting, not a little bit, but twisting of reality and that type of thing. Fantasy has dragons and princes and elves and goblins and dwarves and kingdoms and that type of thing. Uh, kind of think of a combination of Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings. So here we go. You can join me for the dragons and elves and princes. Oh my. Hi, BookTube. This is Kim from K Becker's Books. And today I am bringing you some fantasy books. I tend to turn to fantasy when I'm feeling anxious or need to fill my head with a good story, need to want to, need to escape out of reality. And let's face it, these are times when a lot of us simply want to do that. And in my opinion, readers kind of have it easy because we have all kind I have all kinds of ways to escape reality. And a lot of a lot of us who read novels um, that's one of the reasons why we read fiction, just one of them, not the not the main or primary reason we read novels. But quite often I pick out a novel, especially after I've had a chain of of heavy fiction or heavy nonfiction. I'll want to I'll want to pick up something that's totally unrealistic and non-reality based and fun and quite often extremely well written. Not always, and that's okay. I don't need to read some expertly written literary book every single time I read a book. But the ones that I'm going to show you today, the ones that I've read, um, most, if not all of them, are extremely well written, and they're fun, and they're escapist, and all of the above. And I've also got a small pile of books that I would like to read. So let's get into it. Um, let's just, for one moment, give honor to the master of them all. This is J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. This was a book that um, I, I almost consider it my gateway book from adolescence to adulthood. This was one of those books that I read it in middle school, but this is one of those books that to me felt like I was moving away from more childish titles into something that I chose to read on my own. And it's it's appropriate for a middle school reader or middle middle grade reader, but it's also beloved by adults all over the world. So this is one of my favorites of all times. The next one is um, another book I read when I was a young reader and it has stuck with me. And I think I read it a couple of times. I'd love to reread it, which I don't do often, but it's Richard Adams' Watership Down. This is talking about the Society of Rabbits. Uh, to me, at the time, of the few times that I have read it, it was fascinating, just simply because of the the development and the characters and their rabbits. So this is clearly not based in reality, but is it? So all of the characters are rabbits. Yes, I do want to read that again. Um, a book that I read last year, and if you are a fan of um, mammoth books, is The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to hold this thing up. Um, this was, I think it was published last year. That's when I read it. It was published in 2019. And it clocks in at, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Uh, that's the acknowledgments. Acknowledgments appear in the back of the books these days. It's really strange. Um, and there's also like a glossary in the back. Yeah, there's a glossary and there's kind of like timelines. And if you count all that, the book goes into the 830 page um, clock in. But the text... The story is 804 pages. That's what it looks like. 
I think I read this book in a little less than a week and I basically immersed myself in it. I read for days and just ignored everybody else in my house and I didn't care because I was consumed with the story. It's not a perfect book, but it will deliver you out of reality and push you into an alternate world. Dragons, queendom, not a kingdom, the women are in charge. There's a lot of representation of LGBTQ plus in the book. There are three different timelines, multiple characters. It's almost like a fantasy Dickens. Like I said, it's not a perfect book. Um, the, the story is engaging, but it's not, I would not say that the writing is exceptional, but it was very good and I was glad I read it. And look, look at this. I mean, look, there we go. The sun hits it. It's, it's foil. It's textured. You know, you know how crazy I get with the books. Um, this one I also read last year. Who didn't? This is Madeline Miller's Circe. And again, look at, oh, I'm glad there's sun because look at the shine. Um, Circe, as we know, is the mythical retelling of the, the demigod or the goddess Circe. She's a strange child, not obviously powerful like her father, who is Zeus. No, no, not Zeus, Helios. Um, He's the grandfather? Something like that. Turning to the world of mortals. Don't you love my, my accurate information? Turning to the world of mortals for companionship, she discovers that she does possess power, the power of witchcraft, which, which can transform rivals into monsters and menace the gods themselves. This is a retelling of um, Odysseus. And Circe and Odysseus become lovers. So this was very engrossing and engaging, and it's it's not that long. It's certainly not as long as um, Priory of the Orange Tree. Really good book. Um, it was all over booktube last year, it, and I still see it here and there, but definitely worth picking up if you want to get out of, get out of town, get out of reality. Another one, this is not a high fantasy novel, but it's kind of like a paranormal, which I also consider fantasy. Um, I, I really liked escaping into it. It was a really fun read. <laughs> There's vampires and werewolves and, um, uh, magical people. And it's also a little, quite a, quite a bit steamy. This is Gail Carriger's Soulless. And this is the first, sorry, that's the dog woofing at somebody outside. This is the first book in a series of five novels and it's the Parasol Protectorate series. Um, this is the story of, first, this is Alexia Terabody is laboring under a great many social tribulations. She is the soulless one, and she actually, if she touches a magical being, she can remove their powers. First, she has no soul. Second, she's a spinster whose father is both Italian and dead. Third, she was rudely attacked by a vampire, breaking all standards of social etiquette. This was so much fun to read, pulled me right out of reality. Um, again, there's some steamy scenes in here, uh, multiple times. The very end was like, whoo, but again, it was so much fun to read. I'm a fan of, of paranormal vampires and werewolves and magical creatures and that type of thing. So this is not a high fantasy with royalty and dragons, but it is a super lot of fun. And, and if you like this, there's four more after it. The next two, again, on a theme, are more of a paranormal storyline instead of high fantasy with, you know, the royalty and the elves and goblins and all that. If you want elves, goblins, dwarves, just go straight to The Hobbit and start there and then just keep going with Lord of the Rings. Um, I have to reread all of them. I've never been sorry and the... I love the movies, I think, just as much. This is also the first book in a series. It's Deborah Harkness's A Discovery of Witches. And I think this was, I read this long before I started on BookTube. So I'm going to assume that many on BookTube, BookTube also did. I'm not sure because I didn't go that far backwards. But this is the story of Diana Bishop, who comes from a long line of, of witches and magical people. And she doesn't realize it. And it's set in Oxford's Bodelian Library. Holy cow, if you are a book lover and a library lover, uh, there's so much description of Oxford and the library and so much atmosphere. 
Oh gosh, talk about getting involved in a story and forgetting everything else around you. It's a pretty chunky one. And it's also the first in a series. Um, let's see. Deep in the heart of Oxford's Bodelian Library, scholar Diana Bodelian Library, not Bodelian. Jeez. In the course of her research. Coming from an old and distinguished lineage of witches, Diana senses that the ancient book might be bound up with magic. But she herself wants nothing to do with sorcery, and after making a few notes on its curious images, she banishes it quickly back to the stacks. But that's not the end of the story. Dun, dun, dun. This was so much fun. And um, last year for my book group with the Critical Chicks, we did, a, we did a survey of our reading for the year. And this one was our number one favorite read from all of us, from all eight of us in book group. Loved it. We loved it. Um, and the last one in this section is also paranormal and it's vampire related. This is Elizabeth Kostova's The Historian. Again, this was long before I started on BookTube, and so I'm going to assume that many on BookTube have read this as well. This is late one night exploring her father's library. A young woman finds an ancient book in a cache of yellowing letters. The letters are all addressed to my dear and unfortunate successor, and they plunge her into a world she never dreamed of, a labyrinth where the secrets of her father's past and her mother's mysterious fate connect to an inconceivable evil hidden in the depths of history. This one is vampire centric. So um, I think I've said this before. Yes, I've read the whole Twilight series a couple times. Yes, I really enjoyed it. Yes, I am aware of the problematic aspects of it. Um, but I'm a grown woman and I know better and it's still fun to read. So sorry if you don't like that. Um, quickly, the next four books are books that I want to read, and I might take advantage of that in our current environment where we are all, everybody's, you know, I live in the U.S. and New Hampshire, and the governor of New Hampshire just yesterday declared a stay-at-home order, which doesn't quite change a lot of day-to-day -day life for me. I was already shut up in my house the majority of the time working from home, dealing with a child who has no in in-person school until the beginning of April. So we were, we're doing school online while I'm trying to work full time. And I, I had been going into the office periodically popping in. Um, now he's declared a stay at home order. So school is extended online until May 4th and most likely will go longer than that. We're kind of just waiting to see if there's a federal order um, to shelter in place. Not sure if that's gonna happen. I belong to an employer that I belong to. <laughs> I work for, an, sometimes it feels that way. I work for an employer who's been designated as essential, so I probably will not hopefully lose my job. My husband uh, also works for a company as an electrician who's deemed essential, so we will most likely stay employed. You know, we've been, we've been fortunate so far. Um, but it's been, a, it's definitely been a process and there's a lot of, a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, desire to escape. So the next four are books that I would love to read. This one is Calm Toybin's The House of Names. And this is also um, based on uh, Greek and Roman mythology. This is, I have been acquainted with the smell of death. So begins Clytemnestra's side of the story, the raging, grieving mother who plots the murder of her husband, King Agamemnon, on his return from war. House of Names unfolds this tragic saga where one bloody action leads inexorably to another. How Agamemnon deceived their elder daughter, eldest daughter Iphigenia with a promise of marriage to Achilles, only to sacrifice her to make the winds blow in his favor and take his army to Troy. Uh, yeah, I think I started to read this at one point and I set it aside. Um, and another funny little fact, I found this in my dollar store for a dollar, so... Um, I picked this up. So this, this could be a good one to get going on. The next one is a young adult fantasy, and this is A Curse So Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kemmerer. This is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. And I love textured hardcovers. Textured, yeah, you know. Um, Cursed by a powerful enchantress to repeat the autumn of his 18th year, 
Prince Wren, the heir to Emberfall, thought he could be saved easily if a girl fell for him. But that was before he turned into a vicious beast, hell-bent on destruction. Before he destroyed his castle, his family, and every last shred of hope. I have heard that there is some representation in this book for um, disability and alternate ability. Um, so that's a very positive development. A lot of young adult novels... Um, in, are very inclusive and it's really good and progressive to see so I'm looking forward to that one. This one is a bind up of a duology it's the Sacred Hunt duology from Michelle West. Here we go with the art again look at the art on the cover I absolutely love that it that just completely grabbed me and there are two books The Hunter's Oath and Hunter's Death. When the covenant was made with the hunter god, all who dwelt in Breodanir swore to abide by it. The hunter lords and the hunting dogs, to which their minds were attuned, would seek out game in the god's woods to provide food for their people, and the hunter god would ensure that the hunters, the land, and the people prospered. Um, yeah, this is a chunky one, too, so if this is very good, I'm going to be in there. I'm going to be in that world for a long time. And the last book... I started seeing this author all over some of our favored British booktubers, um, Jean and Jen and um, Lauren. Uh, I will link their channels down below. This is Juliet Marillier's Daughter of the Forest. And this is the first in a series. This is book one of the Seven Waters trilogy. I think I have all three of them because I got them at a library sale and look at that. I know. And so I, I think I have the entire trilogy. Uh, let's see. Juliet Marillier is a rare talent, a writer who can imbue her characters and her story with such warmth, such heart, that no reader comes away from her work untouched. I have heard such good things about her fantasy. Lord Colum of Seven Waters is blessed with six sons. Liam, a natural leader. Diarmid with his passion for adventure. Twins, Cormac and Connor, each with a different calling. Rebellious Finbar, grown old before his time by his gift of the sight. And the young, compassionate Padriac. But it is Sorsha, the, the seventh child and only daughter, too young to have known her mother, who alone is destined to defend her family and protect her land from the Britons and the clan known as Northwoods. For her father has been bewitched and her brothers bound by a spell that only Sorcha can lift. Yep, <laughs> I would love to dive into. I mean, which one would I not love to dive into? And any or all of them are going to pull me out of my reality, out of our reality, and hopefully send me into a swirl of fantasy worlds and uh, vampires and werewolves and, and witches and in kingdoms and queendoms and dragons. Yes, I'm in for all of it. So hopefully some of these looked good to you that maybe it could pull you out of reality for a little while, um, give you a sense of adventure and a sense of fun while we all have to stick around and do nothing and sit on our butts in our chairs and in front of our laptops. Hopefully you saw something that grabs you and that attracts you to escaping it all. Uh... Thanks so much for watching. Uh, write a comment down below. Tell me if you're excited by any of those books, if you've read them already, what you thought. Subscribe if you haven't already. I would appreciate that. Again, thanks so much for watching. It's been a lot of fun to go over these types of books with you, and I'll see you soon. Bye, booktube.